Genesis 14, Genesis chapter 14, uh, we left off at verse 1, left off at verse 1. But I think before we continue, we're going to do the last verse at Genesis 13. There is a place that I want to cover, which is a supposed contradiction. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 13, verse 18. Now, recall that God has told Abram that he can go any place that he wants to go, north, south, east, and west. Abram chose the part that he wanted to go, which he was always going southward. And you saw how the Lord blessed and honored that. And I've taught you a good, valuable lesson on that one. Now, when Abram went southward, this is where he went at verse 18. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. All right, I explained every word in that passage last week, but basically Abram uh, removed his tent, so he packed up his tent, went southward, and then he started to live in the plain of Mamre. So that's the location where Abram's home is at, is Mamre, right here. Living in Mamre, it's also uh, known, uh, located at Hebron as well. So you want to keep that in mind. So Hebron is also around this terrain. So I will write it here because just for sake of space, And then he built an altar to the Lord like he usually does. You may have recalled from previous chapters in Genesis, whenever he moved to a place, he built an altar to the Lord to thank him and worship him. Some scholars, what they're going to say is that verse 18 is not a location, memory. They're going to say it's a person. However, that's not true in the Word of God. It, we can see right here that it is a location that Abram moved into. But their proof text is Genesis chapter 14, and you'll notice at verse 13. And there, there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre. Now notice it's a person, not a city, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. So because of this, that's why some scholars will claim that it is a location of a person. It's... Uh, where the person's location is. It's not an actual location itself. However, it's pretty common when you go back to Genesis chapter 10. The reason why they're wrong about that is if you recall back at Genesis chapter 10, remember that there were so many places mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 verse 6 all the way down to verse 19, or you can go all the way down to verse 32. But if you recall, Cush is one of the sons of Ham, but then some of the places or some localities, they'll name the cities after a person's name. You might recall if a person moved into a certain location, they'll name the location after their name. If you remember that at Genesis 10 study, Genesis chapter 10 studies, that was very, very common. It was common that when a person moved in a location, that they would name the location after their own name itself. So this is not new. Uh, we see that with Canaan as well at verse 15, right? Canaan was the son of Ham, but the whole country itself, not just a city, was named after Ham's son's name, Canaan, okay? So it is a place. Mamre is a place. It's not a uh, person. It is true, though, at Genesis 14, there is a person's name there. However, the person's name and the location is one and the same. Why? Because when a person moves to a specific location, the person wants to say, I named this place after my own name. It was common for people to do that. Okay, go back to Genesis 14 now, Genesis 14. So when scholars try to tell you that's not an actual uh, location or a place, but it's a person's name, they only know a half-truth. And remember this, scholars, when they lie to you or they teach you wrong doctrine in churches, it's always a half-truth. So remember, it's always true, 
but it's only a half portion. So remember that. The devil's lie is always a half portion. Wrong doctrine is always a half portion. So when you believe something to be true, you have to ask yourself, did I study the full context? Do I only know a half truth? Usually people who believe in half truth don't study the whole thing. And that's why they'll criticize yours truly and don't even look at the scriptures. They'll only look at their own scriptures, their own bias their own teachings that they've learned. See, a half truth. But then they'll ignore the other parts of the arguments or the other verses pointed out. So I say that, that way people online can take that to themselves and learn something. All right, they always criticize yours truly without examining. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 14. And then we'll look at verse one. And it came to pass, so, that's a favorite expression throughout the book of Genesis, you might know. And it came to pass, meaning sometime later, it came to pass. So that's a figurative expression for that. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. So notice right here that this is referring to the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. That person's name is mentioned first. His days, his reign. So this particular king was a king of a location called Shinar, and his name was Amraphel. Now, who is Amraphel? That is actually the famous Hammurabi, the guy who supposedly made the first laws or codes, Amraphel. Notice it says Shinar. Well, that's pretty obvious then. What's located in Shinar is Babylon. Do you remember that? If you go back to Genesis chapter 10. Go back to Genesis chapter 10. You'll notice at verse 10, Genesis 10, 10. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, right? Remember, that's the ancient city for Babylon. And Eric and Achad and Kalna in where? The land of Shinar. So keep in mind then that Hammurabi, go back to Genesis 14, that Hammurabi is going to be possibly, for now, let's consider it a possibility, possibly mentioned in this location, Shinar. So this is Hammurabi and his kingdom, Babel or Babylon. Now, how do we know that this is referring to the days of Hammurabi? Well, one is because this person's name, Amraphel, king of Shinar, is first mentioned above all the other kings. His name is mentioned for his days, his reign. So it's a very popular king you want to know. And Hammurabi is a more common king that people would know more than Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, in verse 1. So keeping those, keeping those things in mind, we can see that, one, it has to be a very popular king throughout history. Hammurabi is a popular king for some of you who don't know that supposedly how we can know early writing existed was because of Hammurabi's code. And Hammurabi was during this time of Abraham. A second reason why it's Hammurabi, and there are some theologians and Bible scholars who don't know that, but now historical records uncover that this is indeed Hammurabi. Because Hammurabi, the Chaldean name, Amurabi, is Amraphel, actually. So it's actually a Chaldean transliteration. So it's Amraphel, Amraphel. So notice that your KJV translators, they're very accurate, and they really try to stick to original languages. They try to insist, oh, it's not original Hebrew. How do you not know that they were trying to go? This is a better case. They're trying to go by Chaldean right here. They were really trying to go by Chaldean here, and this is more preferable than Hebrew in this case. Imagine that. Chaldean better than the original Hebrew. Wow, and, that, and Chaldean proves to be more original to the original languages than the Hebrew itself. Now, you think and pray about that a while, you Bible scholars, you, huh? Dumb theologians out there, always trying to correct the Bible because of amateur Hebrew and Greek. And I say amateur too, amateur Hebrew and Greek. Even these scholars who are learned in languages with ancient Hebrew and Koine Greek, these people only know a, a surface of Hebrew and Greek. They don't know the ancient language itself back then. Because uh, Greek has all, uh, there have been changes throughout Greek. 
And there have been lexicon scholars and Greek scholars who mourned about modern day uh, Greek speaking for the so-called modern Greek professors who boast about ancient Greek, that their way of rendition of Greek is deviating from the actual Greek itself. Some, some modern speaking Grecians actually even mock Greek scholars for the way that they speak Greek, believe it or not. That's not really the way how they pronounce words or uh, say the words correctly. But anyways, we go back to Genesis chapter 14. So I, so I consider it amateur Greek, today's Hebrew and Greek scholarship. Especially the dumbed down pastors who just pull out a concordance and lexicon. You're dumber than that. So when you act all professional and snotty, snotty and high-minded and put down uh, Bible believers, especially those who believe the King James Bible is the word of God, I mean, what are you to boast about your alphabet letters, huh? That's, that's like a child boasting about, I can quote ABCs. That's what you guys are bragging about. So we see, uh, we see people or so-called Christians wearing diapers boasting about, I know my letters of the alphabet. So what's that to brag about, man? Let's go back to Genesis 14. You disgust me, man. Theologians out there. I always put them down. I show zero respect to theologians and those who uh, boast with their degrees. If we go back to Genesis chapter 14, verse 1, so we see right here, that's Hammurabi, but another evidence is this person is in line or is as popular or known in reputation as what? Arioch, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. So these are big names, you'll notice. Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, is especially a big name because Elam is... The ancient city, if you recall your intermediate discipleship lesson, Elam was the most powerful ancient city. Ever since the Tower of Babel and things fell apart, Elam became the most powerful city. And Shinar, or the Babylonian kingdom, was subservient to Elam, the city. So we see right here that if Elam is the mo one of the most powerful kingdoms, if not the most powerful kingdom at this timeline of Abram, then there has to be another kingdom that's as least as uh, popular in reputation or in ranking. And King of China right here, Hammurabi fits the list really well. Hammurabi fits the list really well. So that's another reason why we can see that Hammurabi would be another reason. But then we see right here that if it's King of Elam, Chedorlaomer, you'll notice at verse 4, Verse 4, 12 years they served Chedorlaomer. So that's the most powerful kingdom, Edom, right? And in the 13th year, they rebelled. So notice right here, Chedorlaomer is the powerful kingdom. So it points out that chapter 14, verse 1, these other kingdoms, why are they allianced with Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, right? Why are they allianced with him unless they're subservient to him? Unless Chedorlaomer is in control of these guys, right? So then, if we see, if we notice throughout history, Babylonia that time, or Babylon, it was subservient to Elam. It was under the control of Elam, Chedorlaomer. So if Babylonia was under control of Elam, it's natural to think Hammurabi, who was the king of Babylon. So that's, those are sufficient reasons why we can guess that it would be Hammurabi because of the Chaldean transliterated word the verse 1 itself is sufficient in evidence as well and it was subservient to this kingdom Elam Elam was the most powerful kingdom and if not then one of the most powerful kingdoms of that time uh, my cheddar cheese word right brother Randall so Chedor okay Chedor Lay, Chedor, Lay, Omer. Okay, there we go. Chedorlaomer. All right, so this is the big king that you guys want to know, Chedorlaomer. Now, notice that this is about four kings right here. Now, here's a history of what's going on. 
Verse 2, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemeber, king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. So notice right here that Chedorlaomer had four kings with him on his side. So there are four kingdoms. Four kings within Chedorlaomer's side. But Sodom, Gomorrah, remember the big five that I've talked to you about at Genesis chapter 13 studies? Because they're close in locality. The other big five is located at verse 2, which I pointed out Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zoar. Okay? So San Jose, Berkeley, San Francisco, and then you name it, Santa Clara. So the other five right there. So because these guys are sissies and they've always been weak, okay, and they can't man up and they always switch toward, you know, the same gender or whatever, they can't pick up a very good fight, you'll notice. So because they can't pick up a very good fight, you can see right here that it was no problem for Chedorlaomer to just crush them very easily. All right? <laughs> so at verse 2, we can see right here that there are five kingdoms and that they lost to the four kings at verse 1, which we'll find out at verse 3, and then we'll continue on. All these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. So you'll notice right here that at verse 4, they rebelled against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam. So then at verse 3, the five kings, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, Zoar, etc., they were joined together and they were versing against Chedorlaomer and his uh, other kings that were allianced with him. If you look down at verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, the, the five with Sodom, the entire Bay Area and Silicon Valley lost because they were always sissies to begin with. If you go to the college and the universities, you can notice that these guys can't even pick up a hammer, all right? They always are sensitive and they whine about the silliest thing. They think that a little protest can get the job done because that's how sissified they are, but they can't man up and go into a war. So then right now you see a bunch of sissies that can't man up and then take on a country and people are wondering, oh, what? You know, we're gonna do, we're gonna threaten you with sanction. We're going to scare you with that, all right? <laughs> see if that worked with Adolf Hitler back then, all right? And then see, when you study this guy, Putin, see how similar that he would follow along with certain dictators back then, especially Hitler. Okay, you know why? These guys were always sissies, okay? They can't man up. They can't put up a fight. You know, I wouldn't be surprised that maybe Sodom didn't really battle with them. Maybe they said, we're going to sanction you. We're going to sanction you. And that's why they just got crushed very easily. What a bunch of sissies right here, you know. So then you get a Putin or a Chedorlaomer, some, someone big name like that, they'll just crush them easily, you know. You can tell I'm enjoying a good time right here, okay. All right. Uh, anyways, as we return to the main text, that's what happened, and that's the story. Now let's examine some interesting doctrines and cover the passage and each verse one by one. Verse 3, all these were joined together in the Vale of Siddim. So then Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other guys, they joined together, they alliance together in the Vale of Siddim. All right, so Siddim's right here, all right? Now, there's some, um, I looked at all the maps, and not all these locations are going to be 100% accurate. However, they are roughly accurate, okay? From what I compared with all the maps, I went by majority of maps, because people think the majority of scholars was where you get the right answer. So I decided to do that, all right? So going by the majority of maps, we can see right here that these locations are roughly accurate. And then Siddam is majority point out here. I have saw a few pointing out up here, which kind of makes sense where Sodom and Gomorrah is at. But majority pointed at down here. So to play safe, I'm going to put it right here. So the Vale of Siddam is over here where there was a battle. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah, you notice Zeboam, Adma, Zoar, they're all located close to where the Dead Sea is. So they're not all far away from each other. So then we can see that 
If they're going to meet midway, it would make sense that they can meet over here, if they're going to meet midway to alliance together. So then they meet over here, and then they clash with the uh, four kings up here. So when we go to this map, the four kings come, and then we're going to see how uh, their terrain of conquest went. But before we come over there, it says that they joined together in the Vale of Siddam, which is the Salt Sea. There's your evidence of Dead Sea. So notice right here that which is the Salt Sea. So the Dead Sea is over there. If that's where Sodom Gomorrah is located nearby, the Dead Sea, then it supports once more back at Genesis 13 where Sodom and Gomorrah was burned to the ground, it would be near the Dead Sea, if not within the Dead Sea region, okay? So there is no doubt about that because we see right here that Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities, that they met up uh, where, the, where near the Dead Sea was. So there's no doubt that Sodom and Gomorrah, that when it was destroyed, it's at the Dead Sea region. If you go over there, that's where you can find Sodom and Gomorrah, at the Dead Sea region. Now, because it's the Dead Sea, there are some interesting things to note over here. One is, notice right here, it's called the Salt Sea, right? The Salt Sea. Now, I'm going to show you some interesting portions. Let's go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Let's go to Genesis chapter 19. Now, what happened to Lot's wife, and we're going to see it later on in the Bible, but if you study Lot's wife, she was living in the terrain of Sodom, yet she looked back. When she looked back, the Lord punished her, and it's interesting at verse 26 what he turned her into. Genesis 19, 26. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of what? Salt. Why a pillar of salt? It bears interesting to note that where she was turned to salt was at a region of salt, the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. Why would the Lord punish her with that way? Hmm. There are some interesting references when we think about salt throughout the Bible. But first of all, I want you to go to the book of Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Mark chapter 9, verse 49. Now Sodom and Gomorrah, it was burned with fire and brimstone, right? For some of you who didn't know that, it was burned with fire and brimstone. So it was burned with hell fire, okay? Now that's important to note, and I'll go to those verses, okay? But first of all, go to Mark 9, 49. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. So salt's connected to fire right here. But this is hell fire at verse 47, 48. 47, it says hell fire, right? 48, it says where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. That's hell fire. And then the Bible says at verse 49, it's salt. For every one shall be salted with fire. Now, isn't that interesting? And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Why? Because if you won't take the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God's going to get a sacrifice from you either way. That's right. yeah. So you can either be a sacrifice in hell or you can, be that, uh, you can take the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Right, right. It's like my deep Bible study on gold, right? You can either be a fine gold tried in the fire for Christ do, as a result from salvation or you can either be gold, try, find gold in eternal hell fire. See, the Lord's going get, to get it either way. Huh. If hell fire connects with salt, go back to Genesis 19 and go to Revelation 21. Go to Genesis uh, 19 and Revelation 21. I'm going, this is uh, an interesting doctrine that I'm going to show to you. Genesis 19, Revelation 21. 
Now notice that Genesis 19, 24, when God burned up Sodom and Gomorrah, he burned it, the Bible says, with fire and brimstone. Okay, that's the wording for it. The Bible says he burned it with fire and brimstone. Look at Genesis chapter 19. Verse 24, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord in heaven. Okay, go to uh, the book of uh, Revelation 21, verse 8. So God burned up Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. You know what that was? That was hell fire. Revelation 21, verse 8, famous passage that some of you have already learned from soul winning class. Fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which what? Burn it with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So then Sodom and Gomorrah was burned with hell fire. Now some people, they're going to say that, well, no, it came down from heaven. So you can't say that it's with hell fire. Well, uh, wh who created hell, right? The Lord from heaven, right? So the Lord from heaven can create hellfire, but look at Jude. Jude is pretty plain. Go to Jude. Right. And not only that, it's interesting. There are people who believe that the volcanoes and the lava that erupts, it's because of hell. It comes from hell. Because why? Volcano lava activity is from the core of the earth. And the Bible says hell is in the heart of the earth. That's found what Jesus says, in the heart of the earth. So then if all that lava that's inside the volcano is from hell, when, volcan uh, when there's volcanic eruptions, there's also what? That brimstone, right? See, so it's logical. And it does come from heaven itself. It falls down from heaven, don't it? How about that? But it comes from hell. It comes from the bottom of hell. So there's your explanation. Your Bible's a very scientific book. It's smarter than some people who only know one verse and then they don't know deeper doctrine. Yeah. All right, look at Jude. Look at verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, cities about them in like ma manner, etc., etc., the last part, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. That's hell fire, guys. There's no doubt about it. Okay, Establish, establishing the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah was burned with hell fire. The Bible says that Lot's wife was turned into what? A pillar of salt. And the Dead Sea is a region called the Salt Sea. Now it makes you wonder, hell is also connected with salt too. Remember that? So the Bible says that when you go to hell that it will be known as salt. If it is known as salt when you go to hell, and then the Bible says that Sodom and Gomorrah, which is located by the Salt Sea, was burned with hell fire, then it makes you wonder then, the reason why are these all connected to point out where the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, and strange activity in the Dead Sea, out of many other seas that you can go to. The Dead Sea is a strange activity. Would abnormal activities be explained if it's connected to hell in some way? Because hell is definitely not a normal place. It's an abnormal place. So paranormal activities would make sense from a paranormal place or strange activities would make sense from a strange place. Salt, we see, is connected with hell. It's connected with Sodom and Gomorrah and it's connected with the Dead Sea.
and then if Sodom's connected to hell, and then the Dead Sea is connected to Sodom, what makes this part different with hell connected with Dead Sea, right? I mean, uh, 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3, so then those ones might connect to the other ones, right? So you have to think about all these factors. And when you look at all these factors, then it becomes very, very enlightening when you look at the scriptures. Now, look at the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2, and then Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20. Now, this part, I'll consider it as a theory. So don't consider this as a 100% doctrine. This is a theory. It is very important that when you get deeper into the Word of God, that you don't uh, claim things 100%. That is very important to understand. You don't easily claim things 100%. You have to be very careful of that. Because when you get deeper into the Word of God, it requires more studying, right? So when, you, when things require more studying, that means you can't make rash conclusions. More studying means the conclusion takes longer time. So you have to remember that. That's very important to understand. All right, but anyway, go to Revelation chapter 20 and then Jonah chapter 2. I always found this interesting from the Word of God. The Bible says in verse 13, and the sea, right, gave up the dead which were in it. But notice that the sea that gave up the dead is connected to, and death and what? Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. Why would the Lord connect a sea that has dead, right? Those words dead and sea. Why would the Bible have those words within the same verse where hell is located delivering up its dead. Now think about this. If you were to think about what are the closest localities, the closest localities that would be in proximity to hell. You ever thought about that? So you have to go to the lowest places, right? And then the Dead Sea is uh, considered as one of those uh, lowest places, they would say, right? So then, especially with its word dead and sea, dead and sea. So with all these uh, clues that are given out, it would be logical, and why not to say that Revelation chapter 20, it can refer to the dead sea right here because it's, such, it's closer to proximity to hell and it would explain all its uh, strangeness. And then it also explains the connection where the Bible says he brought hell fire to Sodom and Gomorrah. How can you do that unless he opened up one of the portals of hell over here, right? And then not only that, it has that volcanic activity, fire and brimstone, which is related to hell. And then also has that salt activity, which is related to hell, Mark chapter 9. So that's a lot of interesting stuff. Also look at Jonah 2. Notice right here. When Jonah went to hell, yes, he went to hell. When he went to hell, notice that from his vision, his perspective, how he's going from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, how he's transitioning here. Look at verse 3. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. You see that water? Right? Right? And the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about. Notice it gets even deeper, even to the what? Soul. Now he's entering a spiritual terrain. The death closed me round about. The, weaves were wrapped, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. See, he's getting deeper. From sea... From the watery sea, he's transitioning to a deeper location, the bottom of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Why, that's pretty clear then. Then he's in the center of the earth. And if he's in the center of the earth, that's hell. But that's plainly given when you look at verse 2. Verse 2. And said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of what? Hell, cried I. So Jonah, he did go to hell. 
So notice right here that Jonah's perspective, as he was dying, he was going deeper from a sea level, entering into hell. So you see that? From the sea entering into hell. So we see from this passage, why not? That the sea would be the most logical place you can think of in proximity that's the closest and the entranceway into hell. And that's why it's not, a, it's not science fiction, it's actual science. When you actually go to the deeper parts of the ocean, they say there are so many strange stuff in the darkness over there. It's so dark and there are strange creatures. But it's not a surprise to us when the Bible talks about Revelation 9, that from the bottom of hell, there are strange creatures that come out, and hell is described as darkness as well. See, there's too many connections and words that I think that, you know, this theory right here does bear some weight. It does have something that you can search deeper into. Okay, let's go back. And there's your deep doctrine. All right, let's go back to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. Man, the scriptures is so much fun. If you think Bible study is boring, then you're not attending church, okay? <laughs> my members in my church, they even enjoy even a devotional. They even enjoy a devotional, even a convicting sermon. You want to be in a church like that, all right, where you can enjoy anything. Okay, whether we talk about prophecy, deep doctrine, theological study, soul winning, convicting sermon, we just enjoy a good time and we get something out of it. The point is, are you getting something out of it? If you're not getting anything out of it, then you're probably not attending a Bible-believing church. Attend a Bible-believing church and then they'll, they'll go through verse-by-verse -verse studies. They'll preach sermons that aim toward the heart. It's a Bible-believing stance based on the King James-only doctrine as well as dispensationalism. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. We'll look at verse 4. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer. So notice that Sodom and then the other four ninnies and sissies, they were serving Chedorlaomer for about 12 years, and the 13th year they rebelled. But in the 13th year they had it and they rebelled. That's the first time where you'll see 13 mentioned in your Bible, Okay. So it's the first time where 13 is mentioned in your Bible and going by the law of first mention, then we can see what number 13 represents. It means rebellion. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of 13 because I already did that in my previous Genesis study, but there are too many references where 13 can be connected to rebellion. Uh, we see... Nimrod, the 13th from Adam, right? So we see that one. 13 has been considered to be as a very unlucky number. And then there's a reason for that one, because it's representing rebellion. It's uh, Satan's number, so to speak, you can say. So 13 in your Bible is a bad number, usually. Let's go to verse 5. Now, before I explain verse 5, it's interesting that the Bible, he'll go up to the 12 tribes of Israel, right? <laughs> you don't want to go up to 13. Why? Maybe they might rebel against his kingdom, right? So based on a the theocracy kingdom that God set up for the nation of Israel, he wants it to be maintained under his dominion, his control, but go a little bit beyond that, then it would be probably a bad thing. But also in Isaiah chapter 14, it's the 13th verse where Lucifer pronounced a rebellious statement. He proclaimed a rebellious statement. He started a rebellious statement. It is the 13th verse of Isaiah 14. Uh, Genesis 13, 13, total rebellion and wickedness. They were, uh, the men of Sodom were Sinners and wicked exceedingly before the Lord, Genesis 13, 13, right? So there's too many references on that and too many uh, logical explanations behind it. Let's go to Genesis 14, verse 5. And the 14th year came Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him. Okay, so in the 14th year when they rebelled against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, 
The kings that were aligned with Chedorlaomer at Genesis 14.1, they all charged and smote the Rephaims in Ashtoreth Karnaim and the Zuzims in Ham and the Emims in Sheva Kiriathaim. Okay, so look at this map right here. So they come and then they start from the top. Right here, Ashtoreth Karnaim, where the Rephaims were. Remember, the Rephaims, they were that giant of the remnant from the uh, mutations of the sons of God, right? Or the uh, mutant offspring. And then they went to Ham, right? So boom. You notice they're going south, right? So that's how they're going. They're hitting here, boom, the Rephaims. So if they were able to conquer these giants, that's a powerful kingdom that they had. That's a powerful kingdom. It bears learning to know that if we know that Nimrod, that there was that satanic religion tradition that Hammurabi carried, then it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say that they may have had mutations of their own, perhaps, or demonic power behind them as well. That's something to bear in thought. But there's no doubt that Babylon, at Revelation 17, it will have demonic power. Okay? So Babylon, throughout the Bible, might be something to think about. But if they had that much uh, manpower or some kind of power behind them that can conquer the Rephaims, then they had a lot of power, that means. Or they carried some kind of demonic power or offspring is actually rational to think about. But continuing on, then they went to the Emims in Shaveth Kiriathaim. So right here. They, then the next part, right here, the other five, right? So let's keep going down. And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazizon Tamar. Now, if you look at all these passages, uh, let me sh show you right here. This is Mount Seir right here, right? This is El Paran, En Mishpat, Hazizon Tamar. So notice how they're going around, right? Because you'll notice it says, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness, right? Which is down here. But you notice there's a U-turn over here. And how we can tell there's a U-turn, it says in verse 7, and they returned. You see that? See, they're, they're backtracking now. So they're going to go back to where they come from. And then that's why you'll see right here, and Mishpat is killed off, and then, uh, which is Kadesh. Smote all the country of the Amalekites, Amorites, that dwelt in Hazizon Tamar, right here. Now, this list that you see at verses 5 through 7 really, really matches up with Deuteronomy 2, which we looked at last time. All right? But let's look at it one more time. Let's look at Deuteronomy 2. It all matches up with Deuteronomy 2, which I showed you last time which shows that there had to be those giants. Now, you'll notice a slightly different wording, but it's only a slightly different wording. Why is that? Because it's throughout history, you have to understand that city names or people's names, when you give it about 50 years or 100 years apart as time passes by, the name changes or is pronounced differently. That's inevitable, especially with our English language. Our English language is not really English language, you've got to realize. It's a, it's a false language, pretty much, because we're a mixture of pronunciations where we mispronounce words and with the combination of French, and you already saw the Anglo-Saxon history. It's a total mess. It's a total mess. Fiancé is not even an English word, guys, you know, so... And French fries is not really from France, all right? So let's go back. Deuteronomy chapter 2. It's just, a, it's just a mess of everything, okay? Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 2. Now, pay attention to the wording here. You'll notice a lot of the, some of the wordings that matches up with Genesis 14. Verse 20, Rephaims, right? Giants. So that's first clue. Ammonites. Zamzumims, okay? Compare that with Genesis 14 with those verses. You'll notice some of the words matching up. Notice at verse 21, the Anakims are mentioned. Keep reading down. Verse 22, Seir, right? Notice Horims, right? Kind of close to. 
the Horites, maybe, right? When we go back to Genesis chapter 14. So a lot of the similar wordings right here, a lot of the similar wordings. We see Mount Seir, Horites, verse 22, I already mentioned about the Horims, kind of close with Horites. Avims dwelt in Hazarim, Kaphtorims. And then let's see right here. Then we see verse 30, Sion, king of Heshbon, with a seer mentioned again at verse 29. So if you look at these verses, we can see a lot of similarity of Genesis chapter 14. It's pretty funny that the reason why this will match up with Deuteronomy 2 is no surprise because this land belongs to Israel. See that? The land belongs to Israel. So at Deuteronomy chapter 2, when God says, okay, so these are the enemies that you're going to be battling, the reason why God told that to the Jews is because, why? Because these guys in Genesis 14 are living in the same terrain where the Jews are going to battle at Deuteronomy 2 because that's their land, their territory. And if you recall Genesis 13, God told Abram, who was right here, right? He was somewhere right here. And he said, look at north, south, east, and west. That whole land is yours. See that? So there's no doubt Deuteronomy 2 is parallel with Genesis 14, that terrain. All right, go back to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Verse 8, verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. All right, so remember, these are the five sissy kings right here, right? And they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidim. So they all, uh, they all combined forces together, the big five, and then they joined at Sidim right here. So... This is probably the area where they clashed. And it's a good middle terrain where these five cities can join together. Verse 9, with Chedorlaomer the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, that's Hammurabi, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. And the vale of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So notice right here that, let me explain each and every word. So verse 8 is self-explanatory. It lists out the five kings. They join battle together with, uh, with them in the Vale of Siddim. So they went to the Vale of Siddim. Verse 9, with who? So they were conquering who? They were versing who? The four kings. And their names are given with their nations. Four kings with five, meaning verses. Four kings against five. And then at verse 10, the veil of Siddim, it's full of slime pits over here. So then uh, Dr. Ruckman said it could probably even go 15 feet deep. And I'm not sure, but I think today it's, uh, you can still find some of that. Maybe the reason why it would sink and have a slime pit would also explain how Sodom and Gomorrah could, pro Sodom and Gomorrah could sink down to hell. If, hell, if hellfire was the one that was responsible for burning it to the ground, it could have sunk down. And if the Dead Sea is that portal opening to hell, it could explain why it could sink down. But I don't know, okay? That's just a guess. That's just a guess. It's something to look up. It says pit after all, and usually the word pit in the Bible is referring to hell. So I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, verse 10, the veil of Siddam was known for its slime pits right here. And then it points out the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. So they ran away, always being sissies. It just took a little bit of protesting. And then they just, we were going to sanction you. And they just ran away with their underwear still on. <laughs> so that's how sissified these people were. Fell there, so no surprise, they're going to fall. And they that remained fled to the mountains. And then those that were remaining, they all fled to the mountains. So they try to run for their lives. Now, if we see this map, you'll notice that 
Zeboam Adma Zoar, that the terrain is right here, before they hit Mount Seir El Peran and go around, and then battle Sodom and Gomorrah. See that? So then, it may be this. It may be, one, that the clash was over here, because I see one map that puts Sidim right here. But majority of maps put it right here, so it don't make sense. So it may be that when they were going around, that they clashed over here together. Or it may be that when they were coming down, that as they were coming around, that Zoar and these cities, they may have evacuated possibly. They may have evacuated, joined up Sodom and Gomorrah, and then that's where the alliance, and then they battled out over here at Sidim. That's another possibility. And then we're seeing that with Russia, Ukraine. It's logical. Sometimes people, they just evacuate. They run away, and then they'll try to go to a different nearby terrain or alliance country where they can team up together. So that may have been possible. But another interesting, uh, the reason why this possibility can be supported is in verse 11. In verse 11 it says, And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. So notice right here that these four kings with Chedorlaomer, they took all the goods, the possessions, the belongings of two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, all their victuals and went their way. So took the, all their belongings and then they continued on their way. Now notice right here it's only Sodom and Gomorrah they trashed. See that? So it's only Sodom and Gomorrah they trashed. Uh, it's not the other three cities right here, Zeboam, Adma, and Zoar, which can support that possibility that I mentioned that they, yes, they already trashed these cities. These people evacuated and alliance themselves with Sodom and Gomorrah. So it might support that possibility right there. Okay, so in verse 11, we can see uh, that they lost the battle because their sanctions apparently didn't work. And the way that this country is going, it wouldn't be surprised where it might fall into that mess, okay? Because they always lived a sissy life, you know? They think that they can scare away scary people with sanctions or something like that, you know? Yeah, so don't be surprised if San Francisco is going to try to uh, slip on their underwear and keep it on when they're running away when Mother Russia comes down and starts terrorizing all other places. Who knows, okay? <laughs> always been sissies, always been sissies. I ain't, I ain't going to park it there, okay? I'm just so stinking angry. Verse 12, And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son. So notice right here that uh, they also took Lot. Why? Because he was living at verse 11 then. Oh, so now he moved inside Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because the Bay Bridge is so beautiful. So then he wants to move in San Francisco despite of feces all over the ground and, you know, crime rising high. It's still a very beautiful city. I want to live here, you know. So then he forsook his acre of beautiful land to just tr uh, cram inside the city and live in his beautiful little studio somewhere, you know. <laughs> they took, yeah, it's stupid, man. All right. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son. So Lot is Abram's brother's son. All right. So I already explained that part. So that's how he's related. Basically his nephew. Who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So apparently Lot dwelt in Sodom and said he lived there, took Lot's possessions, and they left. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite. So there's one that ran away, escaped this uh, tragedy, and he talked to Abram the Hebrew. Now notice that Abram dodged this whole mess. And if Lot was a good boy and stayed at the right terrain like Abram did, he wouldn't have gotten involved in this mess. So notice what worldly possessions will do. It'll just be taken away like that. It don't matter. It's best to stay in the Lord's will. So go to Proverbs 10 and Proverbs 11. Go to Proverbs 10, Proverbs 11. That's your problem. You backsliders, you. You just love the world so much that you just want to move into the world. And when you move into the world and you forsake the home and the blessing that God has given to you, then you're going to realize what good was that. You, backsliding Christians always start out like, like Lot. They don't become like this automatically, like the Sodomites. You know what they do? They say, 
wow, it looks very pretty. The nearby terrain where it's at. And I have a good reason to move out over there. It's college, you know, it's work, you know, it's better income, it's cheaper or whatever, all right? So then they move to that terrain, and then what happens is, what they do is that they see, then they decide, then they're in nearby the terrain, and then they're in the terrain. That's what happened. That's how every backsliding Christian, yes, I'm talking to you, all right? I'm talking to every prodigal child out there online watching, is that every backsliding Christian starts out that way. Then they end up in Sodom and they think they're very happy. And then what happens? Then you get a Putin or you get coronavirus or you get something that comes along and then all of it is just taken away and you start bawling and wailing and crying. But then the Christian, they were always in their terrain and always taken care of by the Lord. The evidence is us. Look how God's taking care of us. Yeah. We went through hard times, obviously, like the world did, but we sure fared off better than the world. And the Lord blessed us even during these times, right? We've seen how he blessed us incredibly. So just good advice. Just stay in God's will. Just stay in God's will. Stay in God's blessing. And you'd be surprised. You can dodge a lot of this pain that you don't have to go through like the world does, right? Look what happened to the world. Now look at Proverbs chapter uh, 10. Proverbs chapter 10. 10 and 11 are the best chapters that you want to use for what I'm about to preach and teach to you about this. About backsliding people, people who want to seek after the world or wickedness. Look how their life is contrasted with the righteous. You'll notice that uh, Proverbs chapter 10. And then the Bible says at verse 2, Treasures of wickedness, Lot, profit what? Nothing. But righteousness, Abram, delivereth from death. Yeah, he delivered himself from death. Oh, we'll take care of our own problems. Look how well you guys are doing, huh? The wicked world out there, the backside. Oh, I'll take care of my problems. You lay off of me. Look how well you're taking care of it. And that's why your older Christian generations, your mo mother and father who's living right for the Lord, have to save your butt, don't you, prodigal child, you, huh? You have to get a preacher saving your butt, huh? Backsliding church member, you, huh? Watching online. Right, right, right? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm preaching hard on this one. You know why? Because it's a, it's a catastrophe. It's an epidemic. It's a worse pandemic than the virus we're getting. You know what it is? People falling away from churches. People falling away from churches because they have that lot mentality. That's why. And look how well they're doing. So well so far. How many of you guys watching have went through divorce already? How many of you have lost children already watching online, huh? How many of you have messed up? Your job opportunity, the school and everything you thought was well, you know, how, how much did it cave through after that? Yeah, I'm preaching hard. All right, let's, it's a horrible thing in churches. Horrible thing. So many people falling away. And it starts with college. It usually starts at college because that's when they go their own way. All right, let's look at Proverbs 10. And then, uh, actually, we'll look at uh, Proverbs 11 now. Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11. Look at uh, verse 4. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, right? Lot, but righteousness delivereth from what? Death. Again, Abram. Uh, look at uh, verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall, uh, Abram, directed his way and path. He went southward the way he wanted anyway, right? And God blessed him and he was doing fine. Law went his own way outside of God's will. And look at this, he fell. But the wicked lot shall fall by what? His own wickedness. The righteousness of the aright Abram shall deliver them, but transgressors lot shall be taken in their what? Oh, naughtiness. When a wicked man dieth lot, his what? expectations shall perish. Where happened to Sodom? You know what's very funny? Lot lost his worldly, uh, his worldly desire and it took a godly Christian man to bring back his worldly desire. Isn't that something right there? 
Abram gave him back his worldly desire, and that spoiled, rotten, no, so-and-so is so messed up in the mind, ungrateful, could care less, and just uh, delved back into the slime pit of Sodom again. He didn't learn his lesson. Verse 8, the righteous, this is a good one, the righteous is delivered out of trouble, and the wicked cometh in his stead. See, the righteous Abram gets delivered out of trouble. Look at that. He was close by, but they avoided him. But the wicked instead take the place of the righteous who go through the trouble. Lot, went, Lot was that person. I mean, those four kings could have went this way, but they went that way. They were that close. They were that close. Don't you say Christians feel like that? You are this close from getting hit with the world, but we don't get hit with the world, right? But we're this close. And it seems like we're going to get hit alongside with the world, especially when all this crazy stuff was going on. But no, we weren't quite, but it was this close. All right, let's go back. Uh, oh, it's past the time, past the time. All right, then. I have to stop right here. All right. All right, so I'll continue Genesis 14 in our next study, okay? All right, but this is how the map goes, okay? And I don't know if I'm going to draw this out in the next Genesis study, so you might want to take a picture of this if those of you are watching online or you want to write it down if those of you are taking notes. But basically it's this. They go up this way. Abram's home's right here. Then Abram has to catch up to them where Dan is, okay? So then the... The black line is the four kings. They go up to Dan. Abram decides to meet up to them, clashes along with them. That's his attack. And then he chases them all the way up to Hobah, which is where Damascus is also nearby. So he keeps pushing them up. And then Abram, he goes back into Sheva right here. Sheva. Sheva is closely located right here where he meets midway with Salem. Melchizedek is located nearby. Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abram's home. So this is a good central locality. All right? I don't know if I'm going to draw that map and explain it that way in next Genesis study, so I'm doing that now. Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers, and uh, we also learned some, good, uh, we learned some good sermons as well, Heavenly Father, where we can apply to our lives and not end up like Lot. This is a day and age where it's a Lot generation. Uh, following along with those five sissy cities heavenly father and that's why these people don't have the grit or the guts to go against monstrous nations or dictators and it's becoming so weak i mean i can this country will fall apart one day father and it is your word prophesied that and in the meantime we christians just like abram is just sitting on the sidelines while the world goes to hell and just enjoying the blessing you've given to us in our direction that we've chosen in Southward, in Mamre. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.